All right, let me get started. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a tour and a bit of a sort of a um, uh, way to think about what is the what are the right set of abstractions for cloud native development. Um, and I'll, I'll explain this as we go along. So uh, before we get into this, so wh what is the problem we're trying to solve? Um, every business today recognizes that unique digital experience is the key to competitive differentiation. There was a time when it's the quality of the service, it's the customer success, customer service, it's the price, it's the, you know, and all of these things, they all matter, but they all now coalesce through the digital experience that you deliver to customers. Uh, as this picture shows, there's an entire generation uh, and, and COVID obviously has accelerated that, that, that adoption where digital is in many ways, the only way you experience a company. Yeah. Even for us, actually, in the last two years, we have hired more than 250 people. And many of these people we have never met face to face yet because they've just been working digitally with us. Right? So, so creating that digital experience is critical. And when you think about unique digital experiences, the key thing with being unique is that you can't just go buy it from somebody else. Unique means create. So that means you as a business, whether you are a logistics company, you're a pharmaceutical company, you're whatever business, you have to have some capacity to create a unique experience. And that's really the, the key aspect. So uh, now creating unique experiences is not easy. Uh, creating digital experience is not easy, especially because digital experiences have a lot of unexpected use cases that can come up. Uh, you know, if something interesting comes out about your company, the load on your website, load on your mobile app can just blow up all of a sudden. So that means you got to think about how do you bake this up for scale? And, and at the same time, if something interesting comes out about your company, the number of people interested in hacking into your company exponentially go up. So security matters and, and so on. And then, then time, how long does it take for you to get something up? So the, so every business, in order to be creating a digital experience that is unique for itself, really needs to not be in the business of infrastructure creation, digital infrastructure creation, but digital value creation that is inherent to what that business is. And that's really what, what the world needs and what the world is going to be all about. So what I'm going to talk to you about a little bit today is what are the underlying abstractions that facilitate that? And why are those the right abstractions that you need to have? Right. So um, let me start with cloud. Uh, you know, we've, we've been hearing about cloud. We know about cloud. Everybody's using cloud, and it's been around now for you know 20, 20 or so years. Um, but if you step back and say, well, why, what is cloud good for? What, what is the real business value of cloud for me? And fundamentally, it is the the, the thesis of separate core from context. If I'm a company that does a particular task, I don't need to go and do other stuff that is not relevant to my business. Right? A, a, you know, a shipping company doesn't generate their own electricity anymore. Right? There was a time when you had to do that. When electricity was new, you wanted electricity, you had to build it yourself and, and so on. So many things that you did, which was not core to the function that the business is about, had to be done because there was no choice. Now, Fast forward to the digital era, it's a little bit of a similar situation. In the pre-cloud era, everybody goes and buys the hardware, buys the networking, buys the storage, sets up infrastructure, sets up the security, hires people, you know, gets all these things set up and ready to roll, you know, for waiting for the time when when you know people start using it. And often you have to provision uh, provision way more than you need. The common uh, the uh, server center utilization, data center utilization was about 15 to 20%. So in other words, 80% of it is never really used, but it's there just in case you have some anomalous situation and you need to handle that load. Um, so why am I paying for all this stuff? And, and the second, the other part, which is a major problem today is the skill set. Building large scale infrastructure or any scale infrastructure that is cloud native today is deep tech is serious technology, you need very strong depth of experience, depth of knowledge. 
hiring and maintaining such a technical team is very difficult simply because you know everybody needs those people and there aren't enough of them right we all know about the great the great resignation that's going on there's all this sort of the all, all great movement uh, as some other people put it uh, there's massive changes in in the employment arena today and so building and maintaining a deep technical team is very difficult uh, but and as a, if i'm not a tech company why do i need to do that you know i don't i don't keep people who know how to run a phone system or an electrical system i those are all services i just pay for it and i get what i need right so instead ideally i should be able to focus on how do i build and deploy application services apis the digital capabilities at speed at scale and with security and that's really what cloud is fundamentally about saying why don't you focus on that part of the problem let the guys who are focused on on cloud infrastructure on on operating at scale on security let them deal with that part of the problem right so that's fundamentally the 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 value of cloud from the perspective of digital innovation now let me uh, you go back to the other word that's in my in the title which is about abstractions um so it, there's a uh, there's a saying uh, I, I don't know who said this but you know abstraction is basically the only one thing that computer science really does uh, if you look at everything that computer science does in many ways you can say well we're just creating another layer of abstraction so we can not think about the problem this way we can't think about the problem that way and then we can solve it in fact this year's Turing award went to uh, Eho and Alman who wrote the dragon book and the the speech they gave uh, uh, the title of that talk is abstraction is the heart of computer science. It's an interesting talk. It's certainly worth listening to. If you Google it, you'll find it. Um, abstractions are, are really about uh, trying to, uh, sorry, uh, uh, what, what are abstractions in computer science speak? Abstractions are trying to create a way of thinking about the problem that you're trying to solve in an easier way, somehow. Easier because it takes details away. I don't need to deal with the details. Somebody else deals with the details. I can think at a higher level. I can I can kind of abstract my way out of the problem so I can operate at the level that I understand, right? Not at the level the hardware understands, not at the level the operating system understands, not the compiler, you know, not not all these layers, but business level. In the end, we're trying to get to the business level. Another way of putting this is, you know, there's this term that's been around for a long time called the business and IT gap, which is a gap between what business wants and what IT understands and can do. Abstractions are a way of trying to deal with that problem, right? and this is the this is the fundamental thing in computer science. Uh, whether it's the design of programming languages, whether it's the design of libraries, frameworks, they're all about creating abstractions that address particular needs in a way that are easier to process for a large group of people. Uh, there's also a, a law called the law of leaky abstractions, uh, which basically says for anything that is a non-trivial abstraction they are going to leak. That means you can't completely hide the ugliness underneath with some beautiful layering on top. Because at some point, if it's a non-trivial abstraction, you're gonna have to look underneath and go and do something. So for example, if you're writing in C, you can put a little bit of assembler code into it. If you're writing in Java, you can put a little bit of C code into it. Uh, you know, those are sort of programming language level abstractions where you can look at them as abstractions and that, that I love a way to go apply this uh, sort of live in the world of the leaky abstraction. So this is a, a inherent problem with trying to, you know, not see the details to live at a higher level. Is that sometimes you do need to see the details. You need to get down under, under under the hood and do go and do something about it. And and this is one of the reasons why many many systems become complicated because abstractions, if they're not done right, they leak a lot. When they leak a lot, the abstractions end up being painful things and not useful things. Uh, a common way people achieve abstractions in the computer science world is by creating a framework. It's not impossible, it can be done. There are many frameworks, right? Uh, uh, programming languages like Java, they, they have many, many frameworks. Uh, if you want to uh, read a hilarious article about this topic, by the way, uh, th there is a there's an article uh, written about 10 years ago, uh, the title was uh, Just Say No to Frameworks. Uh, and it's it's a hilarious article about how, how we've gone crazy with frameworks. Uh, the problem with frameworks is that uh, what they're trying to do is 
stay within the context of a particular programming abstraction, programming language, programming abstraction, and create a higher level abstraction. Uh, and then you have leaks galore, basically. Th things don't work as cleanly because you know when you go a little bit beyond that the scope of that framework you are now at the lower level uh, it is however a great way to keep something going uh, whether you know you gotta you gotta make it look modern you gotta make it look uh, new it is a great way to do that and many people do that because familiarity wins in many cases people are familiar with something and they want to keep using that because that's what they're familiar with but but it's like the digital native customer the people who are born today, or my, my children's era, they were born into the iPhone era. They were born into the always connected era. They, they don't, they see through these kind of things very quickly because they see that this is not natural. A digital native business uh, works at a very natural way that works for, for the digital audience. And that's very difficult to do when you just live in these sort of very leaky abstractions that you have to live in. Now let me talk about another another term that I put in, in, into the title, which is about cloud native. What is cloud native? This is a buzzword. We have a foundation, cloud native computing foundation, as part of the Linux Foundation. Um, and you know, if you Google it, every vendor has a definition of what cloud native means. But if you just step back and kind of look at it in, in a simple way, it's effectively saying, well, how do I use the cloud in its native form? So what what is a native form in the cloud? So native form in the cloud. Uh, basically involves having capabilities that are available as a service, you pay as you go, and there's a series of things like this that are that defines what native means in the cloud. And it's also a moving target because as technology evolves, we are learning what are the right levels of native abstractions. Uh, today, uh, Kubernetes has won that battle for the most part at, at the compute level. Uh, you know, Kubernetes is kind of referred to as the Linux of the, the, the cloud. Uh, where that's the platform, that's the fundamental platform everybody's building on now, and it's available in every cloud platform and so on. So that's that's a key part of what cloud native means now. And there's a whole series of them. And if you go to CNCF and look at their website, they have a cloud native landscape picture, uh, which you know has about 500 uh, different technologies that form this landscape. So it's very complicated at that level. Um, so from a development perspective, from the point of view of writing some code or creating something, uh, cloud native basically is about saying, do I have the right abstractions to write code that, that, are, that, that is born to live in the cloud, right? It is born to only live in the cloud. It's not born to live somewhere else. It exploits the capabilities of the cloud. It, it thrives in the capabilities of the cloud. It, it, it inherits all the capabilities and gives you the power to innovate on top of that. So another aspect of cloud native development is it's not just about writing code anymore. When I was a grad student, when I started to program, uh, you know, you, we, we, we wrote a program, we compiled it and we ran it on a machine. And there was an actual machine you ran it on. You could see it, you could feel it, you hear the fan, you can feel the heat, feel the heat, all of these things. Physical machine, had a real IP address on the internet, all of that stuff. Uh, today. Uh, you know, first of all, writing code is not a one-person thing. We we depend on all kinds of things. Either we write collaboratively, you know, Git, Git and GitHub and so on uh, are, are key resources of that collaborative development experience. But even more than just writing code collaboratively, we collaborate by building on other people's capabilities in the cloud itself. The APIs, right? We compose APIs whenever we do things now. APIs are the new DLL. We don't share code by sharing code anymore. We share code by making it a service and letting other people consume it. So you write that code one way or the other, you build it, you package it. Docker has kind of won that file format, the packaging format uh, battle for at least for now. Um, then you need to tell somebody who's gonna run it, how do you want it run? And YAML, you know, there are people who end up writing hundreds and thousands of lines of YAML in some cases giving the descriptions, the guidelines, the rules, the properties, the configurations on how that code should be executed in a managed environment. And, and then eventually it starts running. Well, I don't know, it's some, some, some server somewhere in the world. All I know is I have an IP address I can connect to. It's not its actual IP address. It's you know nattered three times over in front of it. There's all kinds of firewalls, all kinds of things in front of it. 
and but somehow it's running. And then you get into scaling, it goes up and down. And, and then that itself often becomes a building block for somebody else. It becomes one of the atomic components that somebody else writes code on top of, right? That means you need to manage it as an API. And also modern day execution, because you're running in these environments where you have no idea what server is running, what hardware is running, you know, and so on, you need to have continuous monitoring, continuous observability of that program. It's no longer that you can just get a log and see what went wrong. You need to have continuously being monitored. And there's some new tech around eBPF, which really uh, dramatically improves how what kind of things you can do at that level with minimal uh, overhead on, on the code. And of course, uh, business analytics on what you do is very important. Who's using my program? What are they doing with it? How often are they using it? Or where are they coming from? And, and so on. So all of this is part of what it takes to take a piece of code, take an idea embodied in, in a piece of code and getting up and running. So it's a lot more comprehensive experience than just saying, okay, I wrote the code, I'm done, right? I wrote the code, I'm done is about 10% of the problem now. The entire spectrum is what a, a development is all about. Um, so let's talk about programming languages for a little bit because abstractions are fundamentally delivered to programmers through programming languages. So a, another aspect of languages in general is that languages impact how their speakers think. That is why it is generally considered that it's good for people to become multilingual because when you become multilingual, you learn different ways of thinking. And, and people who learn, because each language has their own vocabulary, their own ways of articulating concepts, ideas, and some languages are really good at articulating certain concepts, some other languages are really good at articulating other concepts. Same thing applies in programming languages. So different programming languages create different abstractions that help you think about problems in different ways. And depending on the problem, and depending on the environment you're operating in, the abstractions that you choose will make the problem easier to solve or harder to solve. And, and when you design a programming language, what you're really doing is learning how to give a, a way of thinking to the people who are gonna use that programming language. And the way you do that is by picking the set of abstractions to build on. When you pick a certain set of abstractions, those are the things that the people who solve problems using your language have to think in terms of. And those abstractions, therefore, are really what make or break the programming language in the context of the problems people are going to solve in the environments they're going to deploy these solutions in. Right? Um, so let me talk. pick up a buzzword now, low code. Low code is a, is a big buzzword this year. Uh, in fact, uh, there was an article that I think came out in January that this is going to be the year of low code. And there are many low code companies. Uh, they, there are probably more than 100 uh, low code tech companies. Uh, fundamentally, they fall into one of two categories. They're either about creating front ends, user interfaces, user experiences, without writing all the code for that, you know, using drag and drop kind of things like design the user experience and it'll code gen everything for you. Or they're more about writing actual program logic. And, and these are kind of the two sides of the problem. One, you know, in today's world, the, the front end is some kind of a mobile device or a web, web a browser. So there's a front end component and the back end is something running in the cloud somewhere. I don't know where it is, I don't care. And it just works. So low code touches both sides. A, on the front end side, there, there's a whole bunch of tools that there, there's a lot of companies that have been working on this problem for a very long time. And it's getting, it's getting better. Um, round tripping, that is, a, when I create a UI with low code and in many of these creation platforms, you have to generate the underlying code in order to actually run it. I mean, you generate the underlying code, again, leaky abstractions. If the low code abstractions are perfect, you would never need to go down to there. But if the abstractions are not perfect, you will need to go down there to do something. When you do something, can you come back and modify it? That's the big challenge for low-code user interface development tools. And some of them do a better job at them at it than others. Uh, but, but this is a rapidly evolving space, and we certainly expect to see lots of innovation there. Um, from a WS2 perspective, we focus on the other part of the problem. So let me talk a little bit more about that part of the problem. Right? So what is the low-code programming part? Um, so in many ways, you see workflow 
and low code coming together now because workflow uh, business process management workflow management this world has been in this sort of you know let me draw a diagram explaining what's going on and press a button and it'll run mode uh, so it is in, in one level it's a new buzzword for workflow management kind of capabilities and many workflow vendors uh, position themselves as low code platforms uh, low code integration platforms now uh, if you're old enough you might remember the term 4gl uh, 4gl was supposed to be the the next layer of programming language on top of the the third generation languages or sort of the high level languages um, that revolution was is gone um, but in in some sense it's it's another incarnation of that uh, visual programming was a big thing in the early 90s there were lots of efforts at creating visual programming languages uh, and again you know this is another uh, one that kind of went away uh, or is low code a new abstraction for actually fundamentally programming or is it all of the above right but one fundamental concept that is very very important to understand about low code programming is that there is some kind of a pictorial representation of the program you're trying to write and indeed a picture is worth a thousand words if i am trying to discuss with my business user what this program is doing and whether it's working correctly there is no way i can show them go code or rust code or swift code or java code or python code or whatever unless they are skilled in programming in development in, in that language but if i could abstract that program into a higher level picture saying this is what the program is doing now we do this thing now we send messages to those guys we wait for that then we do this the communication becomes easier it's natural to communicate so the picture is worth a thousand words so so one aspect of low code of course is the graphical representation um and and it, it really touches all of these things there is a workflow aspect there is a 4gl aspect there is a visual programming aspect and certainly there are abstractions of programming that all come into what is called low code programming today um, <clears throat> a many many of these systems however that exist today for low code programming are essentially things that give you an abstraction at which you can live and then when you are done when you want to run it it converts that abstraction into a some kind of an existing programming language and compiles or, or interprets or whatever and runs that thing and the problem of course is that the it's a leaky abstraction problem which is a when when you are in this high level world and you have to drop down to a, sort of a real or normal programming language then you are now kind of you know jump from the beauty of the low code abstraction to the ugliness of the underlying infrastructure and it creates a discontinuous programming model so that makes it more difficult to program and also makes it a, a sort of a, a unpleasant development experience because i i don't have a, a smooth experience and low code systems tend to be uh, things that are not so interesting for pro code programmers as a result because pro code programmers or serious programmers uh, uh, if i if i may use that word uh, you know like to have full control of what they're writing and a picture picture is really useful for writing some stuff but when you're writing lots of stuff pictures are the the thousand words a picture is worth the thousand words but you can't take a million words and make it into a picture it's too complicated the picture so you need a way to manage both sides basically so while abstractions are very very important even to make low code work the right abstractions are important to make that work so i'm going to talk about two things that we are doing from our technical perspective to address these problems so the first thing is ballerina this is a programming language we started working on 2016 um and is about to be uh, there's a new version we've been working on for the last couple of years it's about to be released it will be done at the end of this year and and what ballerina from a low code perspective what ballerina addresses is the problem of saying okay how do i give the right graphical abstraction of a program without losing without creating that chasm where i i have to go from picture to code without losing that at all so so the, the the way to do that of course is if you can make the picture the code and the code the picture and ballerina does that this is a this is a hard problem it's not easy to crack but we have cracked it we worked on it for for 5 years now and every program you write in ballerina has a as a unique sequence diagram and flowchart representation 
And every one of those pictures has the corresponding source code. So you can edit as a picture, you can edit as code, and you don't lose any abstraction, any, any information on either side. So, so that's because the, the picture is not an abstraction. The picture is the words, the words are the picture. And so there's zero leakage. Everything you can program can be shown in a picture and everything you do in the picture is shown in the code. So that also makes it interesting for a professional programmer or a pro code programmer, because if they want to open up the code in, in an IDE, normal IDE and crack away at the code, you can do that. And you want to have a conversation with a business user about the code, you can flip the, the tab and look at the code in a picture form and say, this is what the program is doing and this is how it's working and have a conversation and have them contribute to the code at that level enhancing the, the sort of the scope of people who can who can write code and contribute to the, the development of your product right the the other side is so now now i talked about sort of the core logic of actually writing writing code and and how ballerina is trying to address that problem um the, the, there are, but that's not enough because there are other abstractions that you need in order to be cloud as i mentioned at the beginning when you say develop in the cloud it means I'm going to use other people's stuff. I'm going to produce capabilities for others to use. And, and, and therefore, it's always a distributed system. And distributed systems have a well-known set of fallacies. Uh, sorry, there, there is a, there's an article that was written many years ago saying the, the fallacies of distributed systems, which are the things that people fall into a trap when they write distributed systems because they assume things are going to work in a certain way. Uh, so for example, uh, any network interaction is always unreliable. So that's why you need things like bulkheading or, or failover, retry, all these techniques have to be built into how you program in order to make a system reliable. Otherwise you come to order the book or you know, buy the ticket or whatever it is, suddenly it just doesn't do it and you don't know what happened. That's because something, there was a temporary glitch, there was a DNS glitch, whatever, something went wrong, and your packet got fallen, on, uh, dropped on the ground and program doesn't work anymore. So errors are normal. Uh, things take time, unpredictably take time. Even in a local network, sometimes just, you know, the, the thing you're calling might be calling something else that might be have triggered a GC. And so you're gonna take time, right? So you might 99 percentile, you're good, but you hit that one percentile when the, when the latency is bad. So everything must be non-blocking. If you want to create a good, reliable, distributed system, everything has to be non-blocking. Security, the, today's world is zero trust security. We don't trust anything. We assume everything is insecure. The entire network is insecure. You go end-to-end -end security. Security must be always on. You don't assume that that's something that you can do without. Uh, the topology of the network always changes. Things move. As things scale, they move. They get, you might go to a geographic, geographically sensitive endpoint. So everything must be driven out of discovery. So a series of things like this that you need in the abstractions for, for programming in the cloud. And all of these have to be in the programming language, in the programming abstraction. Otherwise, you, are, you have to manage this yourself. Right? Um, so a, a deploying onto a cloud environment also has a similar set of problems. I mentioned this at the beginning, when, when I'm packaging code and getting it ready to run in a managed cloud infrastructure where there are nodes somewhere under the sea or up in a mountain or on the other side of the world, I don't know where it is. I need to tell a lot of information to the system saying, this is the way I want you to run it. Addressing that as part of the development problem is very, very important because otherwise you're saying, okay, I, I develop, I don't know how it's gonna run. So developers must be part of that conversation, must be part of that process. So one of the key things that we have been working on again into Ballerina is creating the right compile time abstractions. So when you compile, we are creating cloud deployable units so that those become the units or the atomic items that I deploy onto the cloud and they scale and run securely in that infrastructure. Uh, so we've been putting all of this together into our Corio platform. I'm not going to talk much about this at all, but this is currently in beta and it addresses a, a kind of everything that you need to do in order to take an idea, create the underlying digital infrastructure and get it out to your customers without having to become an expert, without having to become a specialist, without having to run all these things. And it's just available as a cloud service because it has addressed the set of abstractions that you need in order to be a cloud native developer.
So uh, to summarize my, uh, you know, the, the, the thing about computer science is it's really interesting. You know, everything in computer science can be brought down to abstraction. That's, that's an incredible, incredible clarity of thought when you start thinking of computer science that way, uh, that, that really that is the fundamental thing. We, we, everything we do in CS is all about saying, how do you make, create an abstraction that makes it easier for somebody to do something and layer up abstractions in the right way. So giving the right abstractions so people can do cloud native development without becoming an expert in cloud native development, cloud native deployment, security, all of these things is critical to bring digitalization to the broader universe, not just to the, the hardcore tech companies, digital native hardcore tech companies of the world, but to everybody. And that's really why it is so important to get these abstractions right. And the productivity that you can deliver to your users to the developers, to the organization, to the CIO, is directly related to how good the abstractions are for the world that you want to live in. So modern development and deployment are all about cloud native. So getting the abstractions right and getting them available for that cloud native world is critical. And this is what we've been working on for a long time. Uh, Balin and Corio are just coming out, but these are things that we've been working on uh, for way longer than five years. Uh, and so it's been a long-term effort. And these are things that we've, we've really tried to understand from first principles. So if you want to create the right experience, how would you do it? Not just by taking something and putting some lipstick on it and saying, okay, this is how we do it. But looking deeply at the problem and saying, how do we correctly solve these problems for people? Right? So that they can be productive and create unique digital experiences for their customers, which is what we are in the business of doing, facilitating. Our customers want to create unique digital experience with their customers. And we are trying to create that for you. Thank you very much.